Hello everyone. Welcome to the session. Today we are going to talk about Philip Sidney in our Principles of Literary Criticism class. So as students of literature, we all know very well how important uh, the age of uh, Shakespeare. So we have so many great writers contributing for drama and poetry. But there is a question. Is there any writer who contributed for the growth of literary criticism? Obviously, the answer is yes. In the previous classes, we have seen critics from uh, Greek and uh, Latin literature. And now, here is our first notable English critic in Philip Sidney. So, Sidney was a courtier, he was a diplomat, a soldier and a poet who was born in the year 1554. So he belonged to an aristocratic family. So he served in the uh, court of Queen Elizabeth and also he served for uh, English army. So apart from that his notable contribution is in the field of poetry and criticism. So he has, uh, he wrote two poems, Astrophil and Stella, a sonnet sequence, one of the greatest along with Shakespeare's sonnets and Arcadia, a pastoral romance. But our concern is not about these two poems. We are going to talk about this critical work, Apology for Poetry. So this is the first notable critical work. And for writing this work, there are various reasons. So in the next slide, we are going to see what are the reasons for writing, Phillips, uh, writing this particular work. So we know that this is the first English treatise to discuss the nature and the function of poetry and drama, that is arts. So uh, Sidney had a few reasons to write this. So as a, uh, as a modern reader, uh, people may misinterpret the word apology. But there is another definition. Apology means defense. So here, Sidney had defended poetry. So from whom? So Sidney had defended poetry from the accusers of a person called Stephen Gawson. He was a Puritan minister. So Stephen Gawson wrote a work called School of Abuse in the year 1579. So not only uh, Stephen Gawson, there, are, there were a few Puritans who always wanted to ban poetry and drama. So they felt these two things spoil the life of English people. They spoil the morality of the Englishmen. So they wanted to have uh, religion at the core, at prime. So they wanted to banish poetry. So, so they, they, were, uh, they were giving a lot of accusations on poetry and drama. But Sidney thought as a poet, so we know uh, that Sidney was a poet. So as a poet, he wanted to defend himself and also poetry. So it was an age, we know that it was an age where religion was highly dominant. So we have the domination of the Protestants and also Puritans were sprouting. So at this time, at this juncture, Sidney wanted to defend poetry. So he has given a lot of uh, uh, defense against uh, Stephen Gossin's charges. He, he defended poetry. Uh, the first argument that Sidney uh, put forth is poetry was the first and foremost of all arts. So people of that time, even Plato said, the philosophers are the greatest people. So uh, Plato said they, 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 have, they have the capacity to rule the country. But Sydney, on the other hand, so he said, poetry came before philosophy and history. So many historians uh, like Herodotus, many philosophers like Plato, they wrote their works in poetry so that they became popular. So this is what Sydney's defense. If they don't, uh, if if they didn't write their uh, works in poetic form, they might not have achieved their popularity. Then, he brings out tradition here. 
So you bring, uh, Sydney brings out the names that are used for poets in Greek and Roman uh, languages. The first one, Waits, it's from Roman language. So here, Waits are prophets. So Sydney equated poets with prophets. So they are the four seers. And then the second word from Greek is more important, poem which means the maker. Uh, in the later arguments, uh, Sidney compared uh, poets with uh, the God. So the qualities of God is equated with the poet. So here again the reference. So poets, that means the makers. And then the next argument is that uh, he took ideas from these three great uh, writers from Plato Aristotle and Horace. So Plato wanted poetry to give only morality. And Aristotle on the other hand, he wanted poetry to be an imitative art. And now Horace is the combination of Plato and Aristotle. He wanted teaching but in a different way. So he wanted poets to teach through pleasure, through delight. So, Sidney took all these three philosophers, all these three critics, they are all critics, all these three critics and framed his theory that poetry should teach but at the ultimate end there should be delight. So, it's a combination of delight and teach and Sidney also added that the teaching element in poetry should not surpass or should not dominate the delighting element. And then there is another argument that uh, the definitions given to poetry. So even this is also, uh, these definitions are also taken from Aristotle and Horace. So here, he defined poetry as an art of imitation as Aristotle rightly called mimesis. So he called it mimetic theory, which is none other than imitating. So through imitation, see, teaching has been done. So teaching has been done by imitating men, but it should be given through delight or pleasure. Then he called poem a speaking picture. So a speaking picture, whenever we read a poem, it, it embodies some ideas. But what happens? The ideas embodied uh, in a poem that should be given in compelling pictures. So a poem should be a speaking picture. So these are the two definitions that Sidney gave for poetry. And then the next argument is that uh, for this particular defense, he took the right poets the imitation of right, he called uh, poetry as an art of imitation and he talked about three kinds of imitation. First kind of imitation is that imitating the actions of the divine, which is found in uh, the works like Old Testament and other uh, prophetic works. So where the actions of the, uh, the divine, the God is imitated and expressed. He didn't take that one and he talks about second kind of imitation that is the scientists, the philosophers and the historians, the writings of these people, they, their writing is also a kind of imitation but their imitation is different where they seek truth. So he didn't take the imitations of these people but he took the imitations of the right poets. Who are the right poets? People who combine, sorry, uh, people who create perfect example of virtue and that is delivered through pleasure. So these right poets, their subject matter is not limited. They can take whatever they want, unlike uh, the writings of uh, the prophetic works or the
the writings of scientists, philosophers, they don't have that, uh, that kind of freedom in the choice of subject matter. But the poets have great choice, they, their uh, subject matter is not limited, they can choose whatever they want in nature. And while choosing the subject matter, uh, like philosophers, they have the virtuous ideas and like historians, they took personalities and they combine the both and they give a perfect example of a work. Then, what are the charges that are put forth? This is very important. So, because of this, Sydney, is, uh, Sydney has written that particular work, Apology for Poetry. Stephen Gossin has put forth certain charges. And now, uh, Sydney's role is to talk against these charges and prove that poetry is not like that. The first charge is that poetry is a waste of time. No. We all know very well that poetry is not a waste of time, as Stephen Gossin said. So whoever reads poetry, they get morality, they get pleasure. The ultimate aim of any art is to yield pleasure. So it is not a waste of time, like a catharsis, what Aristotle talks about. So when you watch a drama, so you must purgate your uh, emotions through pity and fear. So it is not waste of time. And poets are not liars. He said poets are liars. So no poet claimed that whatever he said is right. So then we cannot say that poets are liars. So they never claim that their words are true. So we can't call them liars. They are imaginative artists. They used their imagination, created poetry, created dramas. So they, they didn't really want to uh, exactly imitate, it, imitate nature. What they did, they created perfect examples of every kind. If there is a soldier, if there is a king, if there is a particular scene, they, they never a portray what is exactly there in the world but they created a perfect example of all those kinds so they are not liars and then people say uh, and Stephen Gossin people like Stephen Gossin said poetry corrupts our morals no poetry didn't corrupt our moral the aim of poetry is to teach morality but that should be done in a different way by delighting and the last charge and the main charge is that Plato banished poets from his ideal world called the Republic. Plato banished only the bad poets. He banished and he accused people who abuse poetry. So Plato never banished uh, good poets because even as a philosopher, Plato write all his works in the dramatic form. So in dialogues. So we can't accept that Plato banished good poets. He banished only bad poets. So that's how uh, Sidney defended poetry. And now he talks about the condition of English poets of the time. So his views on English poetry. And uh, Sidney accepted that the current English uh, generation, that the poets of his time, their poetry was somehow obscure because of the way they write. So there are digressions on modern poetry. They can be perfected. How they can be perfected? It can be done through imitating, it can be done through imitating the classical writers, not exactly uh, representing what they have, uh, what they had written. Sidney asked the English poets to go through the works of classical writers and they have to learn from them. That is what they, the necessary education for the poets and playwrights should be given. The education should be given from uh, the classical writers. So, that is how Sydney defended English poetry and also poetry, right? Thank you so much.